The Cleveland Cavaliers released wing Patrick McCall on Monday, ahead of the 5 p.m. deadline to guarantee his contract for this season. McCaw, who agreed to a free agent deal with the team last week, played only three games for the Cavs, scoring a total of five points. He joined the Cavaliers on a $6 million non-guaranteed contract offer, which the Warriors refused to match. I want to ask you where he could end up as a free agent, where he could potentially fit well, but also want to ask about the situation at hand. Is it something that the league should be looking into? Is there a rule here that you think perhaps should be changed because of the loophole that's been found? Go ahead, Mike. You had an interesting take on this today when we talked. Just hearsay. <laughs> but remember, if he did not sign with someone, he was still Golden State's property. Right. So he had to sign with another team. There weren't a lot of takers out there offering him money. So Cleveland, who could have been doing his agent a favor, signs him to a two-year non-guaranteed contract. Now, the day before legally they can do this, they waive him. Well, guess what? He's now a free agent. So now he can go to a team that perhaps his agent has already talked to, negotiate a deal worth more than what he was getting from the Cavaliers, and he winds up in a place that he's happy with and really wants him and can use him. And Cleveland has done a very nice favor for an agent who may happen to have a great player down the road some year. We don't know that. But he couldn't go back to Golden State, and he could sign with the Cavs for significantly less. Yeah, I don't see him doing either, though. He's not going back to Golden State. I think they made that perfectly clear, and they didn't, they didn't want to match And anything. the Cavs don't need him, to exactly. be honest yeah. with you. They've got a number of players that the same size, do yes. the same things that he does. Agreed. I think, I think he's one of those guys that fits on a good team. I don't think he fits on a bad team. I don't think you can give him the ball and say, go create for others and stuff. You know, he, he got a lot of open shots, but I tell you what, everybody gets open shots if you play with KD, Steph, and Clay. Uh, you know, they're going to they're gonna be off yeah. you. I could see him going... You know, Chris Paul has had problems. I could see Houston being a buyer maybe in this market where McCaw can make some shots for them, you know, defend well enough at that point guard. Do, do just enough off the dribble and be clever enough with the ball that you can give James a little bit of a, a rest, hard enough the ball a little bit. I could see him going to a good team. He's one of those guys I don't, I don't, I don't like him on a bad team because he's just – He's not that player. He's a nice piece that, you know, that could fit. And he fit well with Golden State and just didn't work out there. But, Mike, I agree with you. I said there's, there's like some loopholes. There's some areas that if, if players kind of do what he did, he becomes now an unrestricted free agent using the rules. Right. But, you know, it, it, it all seemed like when I read the whole thing, I was like, huh. Yeah. It sounded a little bit could be suspicious. worth revisiting. <laughs> My mom used to call me special K. Ooh. Funny. <laughs> Spurs win at 119 to 107. That's their season high fifth win in a row. But they've also gone 13 and 3 in their last 16 games. Coach, that win moves them up to fifth place past the Houston Rockets. What is it that stands out about the way this team is playing right now and hitting their stride halfway through this season? I like their ball movement on, on the offensive end, and they've incorporated the two ISO players in Aldridge, who plays mostly on the box or the elbows. And DeRozan, who doesn't shoot threes, we c coming off of um, actions and then getting into his one-on-one -on -one game. But they've incorporated those two guys in, in, in how they play alongside of some good three-point shooters now. And they, they've changed their lineup a couple times. Pops twisted some stuff around. Defensively, they seem a little bit more aggressive to me than they have been. You know, I mean, they're getting up a little bit more. They're, they're more confident in their schemes. So they're pushing up. Their help is there. And they play very, very good team defense. So if you beat one guy in the Spurs, the other guy's rotating over. You very seldom beat a guy on the Spurs and have a clean layup. They, 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 ro they come over, they rotate, they shift, they scramble very well. But it's, uh, it's their ball movement. I just, and and I, I like the fact that we talked about it earlier. They're shooting five percentage points higher um, as a team in this right. run, 13 and 3. You know, you're taking about 100 shots a game. You're making five more shots a game. Yeah, That's huge. huge, exactly. And you're talking about some of those being threes, too, because they, they stopped having a lot of the poorer shooters shooting a lot of threes. Their top guys are knocking down threes. But I like their body and bo body and ball movement and just how they're playing. They're fine. They're hitting stride. They had a whole new team this year, a whole new look. It took a little while to find it. But, again, I've said this a million different times. It's uh, Pops is the gold standard in this yeah. league for coaching, and he'll find a way. You give him enough time and uh, – He's around that team enough. He'll, he'll figure out. Well, uh, speaking of the Houston Rockets, which is the team that the Spurs just left over in the Western Conference, and the Denver Nuggets, the team sitting atop the Western Conference. The Rockets hold the 10-point lead at halftime, 70-60. to 60. James Harden, unsurprisingly, is leading the way with 18 points. He's got seven assists as well. 
let's bring in again the czar of the telestrator to break down though what Nikola Jokic has done thus far not just what he's done thus far because he does have 15 points in this one uh, he also has seven turnovers what though stands out about his game and what makes him so effective when he is effective let's take a look at the versatility that this young man has he's very skilled and they use him all over the court, not just send him down low because of his height. They take advantage of the things that he can do. First, let's look at him as a passer, as a distributor. They'll start him in the low post area, knowing that he can score down there. But he looks over his shoulder, reads the defense. It's a one-on-one -on -one with Capella until Tucker comes. As soon as Tucker comes, he drops it off to Millsap for the little short shot on the inside. Let's take a look at him in that post area, get him the ball and the aggressiveness that he has. Look everything over, start to make you move. Yeah, it's a miss, but he goes right back after, comes up with the offensive rebound, and then scores. Then on the outside, dribble handoff. I'm going to go down and post up the smaller Tucker. Tucker beats him up a little bit in that post area, so okay. I don't want to get in a fight. I'll just step out behind the three-point line and watch this one from well behind the three-point line as he knocks down the three. So a number of different facets to his game, a very skilled young big man, a guy who I believe I heard you people say could be in the MVP discussions at the end of the season. Well, at least in our discussion, yes. anyway. Yeah. We're talking about it, then he's in the conversation, right? Yeah. If they if they end up with the best record in the West, they'll have to talk about Jokic right. as, a, as an MVP uh, candidate. Mike, how is he? He has seven turnovers. What's Houston doing to cause him to turn the ball over? He's usually pretty steady with the ball. He'll, he gets a little loose once in a while, but he's usually pretty steady. What we see them doing is they're waiting, and he puts it on the floor. One dribble, two dribbles. And then they come after him from the blind side, hoping that he'll either spin back into that oncoming defender or the defender has gotten a hand in there two or three times, which has caused him to fumble it, lose control of the basketball. So they're trying to frustrate him after he puts it on the floor. When he catches and looks around, they stay at home. But once he starts to put it down, he's taking the contact from the body of Capella and then, as you know, Tucker's very physical. When he comes after him or one of the other Houston defenders, they've caused him a little bit of concern. Mike, you know, that's one of those guys when you, when you work with the big guys. That's if you inside reverse pivot, the old Jack Sigma move, so you keep your face to the guy and you never get your back to the basket where they can come up from behind you. So as you rip and face up, everything's in front of you. You can see it. You know, he's, he's such a young player. He needs to incorporate that because that's, that's one of the things. When you start dribbling the ball and they start coming from your blind side and everybody's digging, you get some turnovers. But he'll make an adjustment. He's very, he's very smart and he's got great hands. I, I like that big fella. It always puts tremendous pressure on the defender when the offensive man turns and faces up because now he becomes that triple threat. All right, thanks, Coach Fratello. We'll uh, check back in with you. The Milwaukee Bucks taking on the Utah Jazz. That game's going to be on NBA League Pass just minutes from now. You know, the Jazz have won two in a row, both on the road, three of their last four overall. Meanwhile, the Bucks coming off a loss. And they haven't lost consecutive games this season. A perfect 10-0 following a loss. Let's hear Coach Quinn Snyder with Craig Bowlerjack prior to the game. This is game number 41 tonight. What's your thought? Well, it's, it's hard to believe. Uh, we were walking on the, the uh, just coming to practice and walking on the street today. And, um, you know, you still see some Christmas decorations. And Christmas seems like it was two months ago. So um, it's happened fast. And we're, um, you know, we're growing. I think we're, we're a better team now than when we started the year. And that's, to me, I know, you know, you, you love for the record to, yeah, I think you always want the record to be better. Right. Um, but I think that, you know, as we, as we continue to play and tonight and the next game and beyond, if we can continue to improve, um, that'll serve us well. You know, speaking of getting better, listen, let me take you back to Detroit because you were down 18, but a dynamic second half, offensively and defensively. You guys are very active, and Donovan seemed to be the guy that led the charge. Yeah, you know, really, and, and you mentioned Donovan in the second half, and he certainly did. I think um, in the second quarter, um, really, when Dante and Tabo were in the game, the way those two guys played, and it was tough to see both of them, you know, take an injury because they, those two guys, you could really feel. Tabo played the rest of the second quarter. Dante had, like, five assists in six minutes and hard to lose them in that game and would have also been really easy with those two guys 
playing well for the rest of the team to kind of let up and and that didn't happen and you know Donovan as much or more than anyone um, really midway through the third quarter he came back in and he really dug in defensively and I think he just the game just started kind of unfolding for him and he was instinctive and he was really good. Yeah, he really was. Uh, Coach, uh, finally, we're in Milwaukee, which is the home of Yantas Antetokounmpo. And when you speak of him, I mean, just one word pops up. It's just unique. Yeah. Maybe yeah. you have more. Terrific, yeah. There's a lot of superlatives yeah. that you can use to describe him. Um, and Bud's done an unbelievable job, you know, helping him. Um, bring all those talents out kind of exponentially but um, some of the statistics that you see um, that are unique nobody scored more in the point in the paint um, since Shaq so you look at a guy and you know he's basically a modern day Shaq he's not doing it with post-ups all the time he's doing it more off you know dribble penetration and transition but um, he's a really unique player and, and that makes it it's hard because he's so good but it's also hard because he's so different Coach Snyder also mentioned Dante Exum's ankle injury. He's reportedly going to be out for the next two weeks. So before I ask you about their matchup with the Milwaukee Bucks, I want to ask why the slow start for the Utah Jazz, a young team that we were expecting to see take a big jump at the start of the season. I think a couple of things that jump out at me. When you look at their record right now, they've played 16 home games. They've played 24 away games, and here they are in Milwaukee again tonight. And the fact that they have a 20 and 20 record, just a game and a half out of the playoffs in the Western Conference, I think says a whole lot. The same thing is Donovan Mitchell didn't start out the season the same way that he finished up last season. But so did a couple other guys in the league that we've talked about tonight. Didn't start out great like James Harden, mm -hmm. but he's on fire right now. So if Donovan Mitchell gets back to the form that we saw last year where he was just simply sensational, and then a couple of these nagging little injuries where guys miss three, four, five games, you couple that with a brutal schedule, this team's in a great spot to make a run in the second half of the season. Let me ask you, Kevin, because you and I talk a lot about these young players who the team tends to, well, the league tends to figure out in their mm -hmm. sophomore season. Do you think that that's the case here with Donovan? No question. When you take the league by storm like Mitchell did, especially the second half of last year, everybody now, you're the number one guy in the scouting report. So the coach stands in front of the group in the morning before the game and says, this is how we're stopping Donovan Mitchell. I'm putting my best defenders on him. I'm forcing him left. He likes to pull up. Whatever your tendencies are, they say we're taking your favorite tendency away, making you play to your, your weaknesses, not your strength. And I, as a young player in this league, it's like a chess match. You start off with the same opening in your chess match five, six times in a row. Finally, the guy says, you're not doing that. You're not beating me with that. You have to change up. I always, I've told this story before. I remember the first time I played in the playoff series against really talented players and that were really smart, were Kyle Wall Jones and Bobby Jones, and they played for Philadelphia 76ers. So I had the move where I'd fake left, turn around, fade away, jump shot. Hell, Bobby Jones jumped before I did. He blocked it. I mean, he just, I, I didn't have anybody block that shot since I don't know when. And I was like, dang, like, I got to come up with plan B here. They made you play to plan B. They took away your favorite move, and that made me a better player. And I said that Donovan Mitchell er earlier this year was going to look at film. Quinn's a really good coach, Snyder. He's going to figure out what the defenses are doing to him, and he's good enough that he'll go to plan B and C and get counters. So I think it's a tough schedule, like Mike said. And then I think it's just, you know, Donovan, the league caught up to him. Now he's figuring out what they're doing, and he's making, making the next jump. So it's just you're always doing this. As a young player, and you're trying to get here, you just you do, you do this all the way up and he's just on his you know just stages of growing up that ladder and they're taking on a Milwaukee Bucks team that's sitting 